Well, good morning, Hillside family. So uh, grateful that you're here for part five in our series that we've been in. Uh, this series on the Bible and mental health, it has made such a huge impact in so many people's lives. The response has been extraordinary, uh, really in many ways overwhelming, and I'm so grateful uh, for how God is moving in the so many, many, many stories. And I, I just want to say to you from our entire staff, to everyone, regardless of what campus you're at or if you're watching online, and we certainly welcome you, is that our staff is here. And I want to remind you of this. Never, ever, ever, ever to embarrass you, only to encourage you in your spiritual journey. So you take it at your pace. And whenever you feel that you need prayer or biblical counsel or encouragement or you need us to help you partner up with a licensed professional counselor uh, or psychologist, a Christian counselor or Christian psychologist, uh, we would be glad to give you recommendations and to help you. And, and here's what I want to say. I acknowledge and know that we are all just fellow sojourners and strugglers in this world and in life. And I just want to remind you uh, that if there's anything we can do for you, uh, we do love you, we care for you, and it has been a privilege to help so, so many uh, in the last few weeks through this, but we know that maybe for some, uh, it may be a month down the road, or it may be in another season of your life. Just remember that we are always here to encourage you, never to embarrass you, and you take it at your pace, but when you're ready, we're always here for prayer, encouragement, and for counsel. Uh, that being said, too, this is part five. This is the last day of this series. After this, next week, our teaching team is going to kick off a brand new series, and the title of it is Greener Pastures. Greener Pastures. The subtitle, Why the Next Thing is Not a Better Thing. Can I get an amen? Why the next thing is not a better thing. The Bible has so much to say about how we're constantly chasing and chasing after greener pastures. And uh, you can have a, a much more fulfilling and content life in Jesus Christ uh, when we do it the way that God's word uh, instructs us to do it in our pursuit uh, with the Lord. But today I want to talk to you in part five about peace of mind about peace of mind. Part one, we talked about, hey, you're not alone in this. And we see that biblically, that is true, that some of the strongest leaders and amazing godly men and women in the Bible struggled with uh, mental health uh, uh, issues or struggles. Uh, secondly, we talked about in part two about worry and anxiety. Part three, about sadness and depression. And in part four, about stress and burnout. And today, I want to talk to you about peace of mind. And I want to just say this as we jump out there, that this verse is not going to be on the screens. Uh, and I just want to read a, a verse to you that the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. And I want you to give consideration that what I'm talking about today is having peace of mind in the midst of mental health struggles, not peace of mind with the goal of the absence of mental health struggles. There's a major distinction. Yes, it is possible that there is a peace of mind that comes from the Lord by the renewing of our minds that can actually lead to, and this is important, can lead to the complete absence. It can, your, your struggles, your anxiety and your worry, your sadness and depression, your stress and burnout can dissipate. It can evaporate. It can, could completely go away. But for many of us, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, uh, it's more about peace of mind in the midst of the struggle. And this is where the value is. When you're in the middle of the storm, you can still have the great paradox. Uh, peace of mind does not mean, oh, I have the peace of mind of God, so now, therefore, I'll never be worried or anxious at all. Uh, that's not always the case. And the best example I can tell you is Christ quoting Scripture on the cross in the midst of his own anguish and grief. We see that Jesus himself, right, absolutely in total peace, Willingly going to the cross, but yet still carrying the grief and the anguish. So, Paul expresses this beautifully. God's word expresses beautifully. Listen to this. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, 
In other words, we ourselves who have the Holy Spirit in us because we are sons and daughters of the living God. We've been transformed by Christ. Paul says, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Paul's saying, I have such a peace of mind that everything's going to turn out fine. When Christ comes back, I'm going to get a brand new body, the adoption to sonship, and a redemption of my body. In the meantime, what does he say? We groan inwardly. There's an ongoing struggle while he has the peace of God. And this is what I want to talk about today, very specifically, is this. Peace of mind is rooted, peace of mind is rooted in peace with God, which brings the peace of God. The bottom line for today is that the peace of mind that we're talking about, it's deeply rooted first in peace with God. The only way that we experience peace with God, according to the Bible, is through the cross of Christ. It is through Christ's shed blood on the cross that we have a way that has been made to, for us for cleansing and redemption so that we no longer live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Just so we're clear, if you're new to Bible study or you're new to understanding what the Bible teaches at all, this is, this is really valuable, by the way, is that the Bible says that we are enemies of the cross of Christ until we repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And then Jesus himself says in John 15, then we become friends. Then we become sons and daughters and co-heirs. So there is a major transformation and there is no peace of mind without peace with God. So long as you and I keep living in rebellion, and I'm saying what the Bible says from a biblical worldview, from the biblical uh, point of view, right? So long as we keep running and leading our lives in rebellion against God, we'll never have peace with God. And the only way to make peace with God is through the cross of Christ. And how you do that is you repent of your sins and your sinful nature. You invite Jesus Christ into your life and you give him control of your life. And you tell him, I want you to be my leader and my forgiver. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. And when you do that, there is a reconciliation that takes place between you and the Heavenly Father by the shed blood of Jesus Christ through the cross, through the power of his resurrection, where he has given us victory over sin and death and ultimately the promise of eternal life and a hope of his coming kingdom. Now, when we talk about peace of mind is rooted in making peace with God, well, okay, now if you have done that, then what happens? Then this brings the peace of God. A peace of God that the Bible says transcends all human understanding. A peace of God that comes that sometimes you really, you just can't even necessarily explain it. This is what I want to talk to you about in the middle of anxiety and worry depression and sadness, stress and burnout, that you can actually have the peace of mind that's rooted with, because you have peace with God, that is then the overwhelming peace of God. And it doesn't mean that you're not still in the battle, battle with your mental health struggle. So one of my favorite passages that I read often is going to be our main text today. If you have your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 12. It's the classic quintessential passage on how do we then get this peace, right? Let's go back for a second to that phrase there. Uh, how do you get this, this peace of mind because you've made peace with God, now you have the peace of God, is, is there's a peace of mind. But before we go to the, uh, you turn to the Roman 12 passage, I want you to see a verse that sets this up about what goes on in our lives and world and has always gone in, on in creation, which is why Paul says, we groan inwardly as we wait. We're at peace in our mind because we have the peace of God because we made peace with God even though we groan inwardly as we struggle until all this goes away. It is this 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. In the middle of the life storm, the one thing that the enemy, the serpent, the evil one's trying to do is he wants to take our minds and lead them astray away from what? Pure devotion to Christ. He doesn't want us to be devoted to Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, says something really rich and very, very powerful. He says this, starting in verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, so that this is speaking to us 
He's, he's talking to Christians. He's not saying to non-Christians or non-believers. He's saying, hey, to all of those of you who have repented of your sins, given your life to Christ, and you are following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in view of God's mercy, here's what you're to do. You're to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship, to offer our whole selves to God. This is, this is real worship. Now, I highlighted here to offer your bodies. He's not talking about just like a literal like offering of a physical body. You interpret this, or we should interpret this as the whole self. This is taking the whole self, and notice it says you make it a living sacrifice. Now, this is fascinating, Hillside family. A living sacrifice. Sacrifices aren't living. That's the whole point of a sacrifice. The sacrifice is dead. So this is the unique paradox of the Christian life. When Jesus Christ says, hey, you wanna follow me? Take up your cross, and now you can come follow me. You're like, well, wait a second. A Roman crucifix killed people. They were bludgeoned. It ended in death, not in life. So how do I take up my cross? Or in other words, how do I take up my own death and die to myself and yet live for you? It's as a living sacrifice. This has certain implications. This means that my whole self is fully devoted to the Lord as if I have died to myself in order to only live for him. This is the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter two where he says, I no longer live. Christ has been crucified and he was crucified for me. And I no longer live because I now am crucified. In the life I now live, I live in the body, right? How? I live in this body, but I live it for the Son of God, the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. Are we willing to lay down our lives in such a way? This is the holy, pleasing part to our Heavenly Father. Now, verse 2, he goes on and he says this. Now, do not conform then to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and his perfect will. It tells us here now something to avoid. Avoid conformity to the world. Do not conform specifically what? To the ways of the world. Now I wanna just be very, very blunt here is the whole purpose of the enemy's temptations. The evil one's constantly tempting us to think like the world, behave like the world, believe in the ways of the world, adopt the viewpoints of the world so that we will get pulled in and he is masterful, let's just be honest, he is masterful at sucking us in, drawing us in. The world is a, a massive lure, uh, and, and it's constantly beckoning and calling forth, hey, believe this way. Don't, don't listen to the scriptures. Don't listen to the, the, the word of God. That's, that, that's not what you want to do. And the Bible's telling us the opposite, and then it tells us to have a transformation specifically by our minds being renewed. Then, and only then, can we know and test God's perfect, pleasing, and good will. You know, one of the number one questions I get asked over and over as a pastor, over 30 plus years of being in ministry as a pastor, people say, hey, pastor, how do I, how do I discover God's will for my life? How do I know God's will for my life? And I always say, I got a Bible passage for you. And I'll take them to Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. And I say, this is how you know and begin to understand the will of God, and it begins in the renewing of the mind. So let, let me make this connection here. In order for us to have peace of mind in the midst of mental health struggles, it is the anticipation and understanding that it requires a renewing of the mind. And the Bible here is telling us three really important, clear things in these two verses. It is speaking to us about reformed thinking, and then conformed thinking, and then transformed thinking. And once we get a hold of this and we say, what is it actually asking of us? We can see that the Bible is saying certain things. It is saying in these three things, submit your whole self to God, shed your current worldly thinking, and then stand on new ways of thinking. What this is really saying is this, submit, shed, stand. Submit your whole self to God, how? Hey, a living sacrifice. It's not just about like my physical body, but Jesus said, if you're gonna submit and you're gonna love, then you're gonna submit and love with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your, your mind. 
This is what our true act of spiritual worship is. And that is, is that we're going to submit ourselves and our whole selves to God, which means I got to submit my thinking. In fact, Romans 12, 1 and 2 makes the connection. And that is verse 2 is telling us the key to being a living sacrifice, to being sold out for the Lord and committed to his ways and therefore experiencing peace of mind even in the midst of life storms. The key to all this is paying attention to what's going on in the mind. So verse two, your mind is either constantly being conformed to the thinking of the world or it's not. So he's saying avoid this conformity to worldly thinking. And then as that's happening, there's also a need to have transformed thinking. There's a a need for constant reforming and a transforming then of what our thoughts are so that we are able to have new ways of thinking. That This is so vital to having peace of mind in the midst of of any life storm or mental health struggle. Now, let me break this down a little bit more. First, reformed thinking. Reformed thinking begins in what you love most. Reformed thinking begins in what you loved most. Whether you're a believer or not, whatever it is, what you love most or who you love most is constantly reforming your thoughts because that's where your affection and devotion is. And whoever or whatever has your chief affections and devotions will begin to constantly reform and renew your thinking. If your love is for your job, if your love is for your career, first and foremost, it will reform the way you think and the words that come out of your mouth and the people closest to you, they can tell what you love. If it's a hobby that you love more or even if it's another human being that you love more, right? This begins reforming our thinking. Well, Romans 12, 1 is telling us, and this is so important, is that the reforming of our thinking needs to be in what we love most, and Jesus told us to love the Lord God most. Mark chapter 12, verse 29 and 30, after they said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, if you're the son of God, what's the most important commandment in all the Bible? And Jesus says the most important one. He says, well, there's two. And the first he says is this, hear, O Israel, Jesus answered them, The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And then you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Jesus says that real love is a beginning point of the mind. So therefore, to have a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1, I have to not conform to the patterns of the world, but I need to have my mind renewed. And the renewal process begins and the reformed thinking begins and what or who I love most. And I'm called to love the Lord most. So if there is something that you and I can identify, and here's the point, if there's something that we can identify or someone that we can identify that we actually love more than we love Jesus Christ, than we love our heavenly father, If there is someone that you love or something you love more, trust me, that is the thing that is reforming your thinking. And the Bible tells us if we love something or someone more, Romans chapter one, then we love the created things more than we love the creator. That sin is called idolatry. And anytime we love a creature or a created things more than we love the creator, I'm gonna be honest with you, we need to anticipate that we are going to experience Some worry, anxiety, sadness, depression, stress, potential burnout. Why? Because God didn't create and order our lives that way. And when we love someone or something more than we love God, we're not gonna lay down and surrender and submit our whole selves as a living sacrifice to God. So already then we're gonna be struggling in our lives in that circumstance with being reformed by the world instead of being reformed by what it is that the Lord is leading us to. The second thing, though, I want you to notice in this is this. Conformed thinking begins in what you desire most. Conformed thinking then begins in what it is that you desire the most. So where are your affections or where are my affections and where is our our desire? If you don't believe this, think about what one of Jesus' closest friends, John, said, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and set through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. 
He's saying really clearly, hey, be, pay attention to this. If you have a love for the world, now you're seeing the first two kind of tying together. He goes on, verse 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father. This isn't from the Father. This lust, this desire for the things here in this world from the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life, it doesn't come from the Father, but from the world. And then he concludes, the world and its desires pass away. The world is set up that these desires are gonna leave you feeling empty and bankrupt. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. So when I'm reading Romans 12, one and two, I see that reform thinking begins in what I love most or who I love most, right? And then conformed thinking begins in what I desire most. If I'm paying attention to this, I realize that the Bible, what it's calling me to is desiring the things of the word, not the things of the world. It's to desire, what are the things of the word of God? What is the word of God saying to me and what's it speaking to my heart? And of course, if my desires get disordered and if my love and affections uh, become twisted and therefore I start moving towards any form of idolatry other than loving God with all of my heart, soul, strength, and mind, first and foremost, of course, that's gonna begin to even have an impact in my spiritual health and for sure, my thinking and my mental health. The third part, though, is that transformed thinking begins in what you live for most. But that comes from the love, right? The affections and then the desires. So it comes from really where are we and our love for the Lord and then what is our commitment to living as a, a fully surrendered uh, brother or sister in Christ that I think that Paul is encouraging us to do? Well, he speaks about this four chapters earlier, Romans chapter eight, verses five and six. Those who live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, Tommy Pollitz, your mind is gonna be set on what the flesh desires. Now notice how it's tying in, again, that idea of conformity in the world and desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit, if you actually live in accordance with the Spirit, then you'll have your mind set on what the Spirit desires. So if I'm a living sacrifice and then I'm going to live according to what the Spirit wants, then my mindset and my mind is going to be renewed by the Spirit based on the desires of the Spirit, and God will begin to place His desires in me. And one of those will be that I will come to hate my own sins as much as the Lord hates my sin. And this is a beautiful thing. It's not a good place when we love our own sins, right? It's one of the best things. You know when you have a really good friend? You know you have a great friend when they challenge the sins you've come to love. You don't have a great, deep, intimate friendship until you have a friend who does it lovingly, not judgmentally, not with a spirit of legalism. My closest friends challenge the sins that I have come to love, and my wife does it very well, <laughs> right? Jonathan Mast, he's gotten really good at it, right? Because they're great friends. They're amazing friends. They see something, they can notice something, right? But this is the whole thing about being walking in tune with the Spirit is, is then your desires begin to change. You start craving what it is that God craves for you and I crave what the Lord craves for me. But, but when I'm living according to the flesh, boy, it's just like I start getting consumed with the thinking and the ways of the world and the enemy sucks me in and this becomes a deep problem. In other words, the renewing of the mind is through the word by the Spirit, period. All throughout the Bible, we want to have this renewed. If we want peace of mind in the midst of our life storms and our mental health struggles, it doesn't mean that all of those struggles and life storms just go away immediately. They didn't for Moses. They didn't for David or Elijah. Boy, they certainly didn't for Jeremiah. A lot of the lamentations in the Bible are the crying out. And some of the Psalms is their, their laments of where are you, God, in the midst of this? Certainly for Paul and his shipwrecked experiences when he said that he felt like it was beyond anything he could even tolerate, that it was beyond what they could take, that they feared even death itself. There is a mental anguish even as he's being obedient to the Lord. And certainly Jesus Christ on the cross, quoting scripture as he is facing the anguish and living out the very thing he prayed in anguish and sorrow and grief in the garden of Gethsemane. All of the renewing of the mind is through the word of God, the truth 
of God's spoken word to us, Jesus Christ, the living word, the word of God himself, giving us then the written word. And it's all interpreted and seen through the spectacles, through the inspiration, the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from his presence and our lives and heart, we could never uh, properly interpret scripture or apply scripture. The Bible even says that non-spiritual people cannot understand the things of the scripture, the things of the spirit, because they can't really understand the truths unless the spirit imparts and, in, and illuminates, right? And illumines the mind to understand these things. And so when I'm reading Romans chapter 12, I think, oh my goodness, all of this has to take place. What is that? Me submitting my whole self to God, shedding my current worldly thinking, standing on new ways of thinking. It must be by the word through the Holy Spirit. And this is the key important thing. When I think about what the Bible has to say, I must continue in this pathway regularly, ongoing, so that I am reformed in my thinking because I'm a living sacrifice. God, you get it all. What? You have my thoughts. You have my opinions. Your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. So you get my thoughts. You get my opinions. You get my money. You get my heart. You get my life. You get my gifts, my talent. You get my family. It's where I can start to say, according to the scriptures. And it doesn't bother me to say this. It may bother you, but it doesn't bother me to say, I am nothing apart from Christ. I have nothing apart from Christ. I am nothing and I have nothing apart from Jesus Christ. That is my personal testimony. So now I can surrender my life as a living sacrifice and say, reform me. And reformation for me in my mind is that when the truth of scripture comes and says something that I didn't understand, maybe that I'm not living out, something I didn't believe, uh, then what happens? Whether it's through a sin of ignorance or even a sin of my own arrogance, then I can allow the word of God to begin to reshape and remold and reform who I am. Then what begins to happen is God's calling through the scriptures like, stop conforming yourself to the ways of the world, Tommy. Change your pattern of thinking. And oh my goodness, this has been a three decade plus battle, almost four decades now as a Christian. I've been a Christian since 1985. So uh, actually uh, one year away, 20, uh, 39 years. I'm one year away from experiencing, uh, because it was around January, February that I became a a Christian, the winter of 1985 in Dallas, Texas, where I grew up. I'm one year away from my 40th anniversary of my real birthday, being a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, a new creation in Christ. The old is gone and the new has come, and it is an ongoing renewing of the mind. Never, ever, ever will my mind stop being renewed by the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit teaching me to think new things in the midst of my own life storms or my own worries and anxiety, any sadness or depression or grief that I may experience, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, and certainly any stress or burnout that I might experience. Now you say, now Tommy, how does this happen in your world or life? How do you, would you apply this? Well, Don and I, for a short while, we had uh, several young couples coming to our house uh, for a period of, I think it was a year and a half to, to two years. And they would come, these five couples would come over, and here's what we committed to them. Hey, we just want to pour into you a little bit of our life learnings. Uh, once a month, if you'll come over, we'll have dinner together. And then we're going to read these books, this list of books. And we read a book for each time that we would gather together and we would write out like a one page, white page paper. We would exchange it with each other and we just talked through life. And we promised and committed to them, we'll open up our home and our lives. And we told them the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's, we got, there was nothing for us to hide. We loved these couples, we didn't care. We knew that they were raising young kids and that we had been through some of those stages. And so it was a great time for all of us to learn from one another. Towards the end of this, one of those young men, godly young man, really loves the Lord. Uh, in front of everyone, he looked and he said, Pastor, he said, Tommy, it is so evident that the peace of God is on you and with you, even as you have such extreme responsibilities in our community. He said, how 
does that happen? I said, oh, trust me. There's only one way that I have. I, it's, it's not a hard question. I can tell you why I have the peace of the Lord and peace of mind as I lead. One answer. I pray scripture. You know, yeah, yeah, pastor, you've told us that before. That's all I got. Give me something else. I mean, something really, like really some deep spirit. Pray scripture. No, 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 I want to pray scripture. And pray it over and over and over and over and over if you want peace of mind. How many ever times it takes and whatever it takes. You pray and I pray the scriptures. This calling and responsibility at Hillside Christian Church as one of your pastors would make me a complete wreck if it wasn't for the joy of being able to get alone with this precious gift of God's word. Whether it's on my iPhone at a doctor's office waiting, sometimes I'm waiting for an appointment. I'm like, okay, you can scroll social media if you want. I don't have social media, so I can't. But I can get on the internet. I can start looking at things. I can start reading. Or I, I can pop up the, open the Bible app and I can start praying through scriptures. If my mind is being sucked in by the world on something and I know scriptures to go to. And if you pray scriptures enough, you'll start to know exactly where there are things that you want to go to in order to deal with whatever it is that you're facing. So I told him, I said, I pray the scriptures. It is the only way, and here's why, it is the only avenue I know to have my mind completely renewed. Because as I am praying scripture, I have an encounter with the Holy Spirit's powerful presence and God's word reforming my thinking. And oftentimes, I find Psalm 139 comes alive in my heart and I find that the word of God begins to break me in order to remake me. And I say, Lord, what in me offends thee and lead me in the everlasting way? What in me offends thee and lead me in the after, everlasting way? And this transformation starts to bring peace in the midst of the anxiety and worry, in the midst of the stress of the job or raising the children, in the midst of whatever sadness or grief I have because I just found out uh, that another good friend of mine has passed away, whatever it may be. And so whether it's mild, moderate, severe, spiritual, situational, biological, or chemical, whatever matrix it is that makes up that mental health struggle, it is the renewing of the mind that allows us to have a peace of mind often as we are in the middle of that struggle. So what does that look like for me? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Do you know that's exactly what the enemy does? Sets himself up against the knowledge of God and tries to get us to believe it. John chapter 8. Jesus said that Satan, the evil one, is the, the devil is the father of all lies. He loves to lie to you and me, and he loves in the battlefield of our mind to get us to believe in those lies. And the lies he wants us to believe are lies about, well, the scripture can't really do that for you, or you need to start thinking the way of the world, or maybe even brings to mind something that someone said to you, maybe a mom or a dad, a brother or sister, a friend said something to you that cut you to the quick and hurt you, maybe as a child or a middle school or high school student, maybe in college, and you have held on to that and you have nursed it and you have turned it over and over and over in your mind and the enemy loves to bring you down, make you believe that lie. Maybe some of you, I've had men tell me that their fathers told them they would never amount to anything. And now they have spent an entire life trying to prove their fathers wrong, even if they don't have a relationship with their father. This is the kind of stuff that the enemy constantly wants us to, to go into. And the Bible says that every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of what we know that God says is actually true about us, we ought to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Hillside family, this is why I pray the scriptures. I pray scripture because it helps me take captive every single thought that I have and to take it to my Savior, Jesus Christ, and say, change my thinking. Renew my thinking in the storm. Renew my thinking in the darkness. Renew my thinking in my grief and sadness. Renew my thinking in this worry and anxiety for my kids or for the church or for my whatever it may be. So what am I doing there? What I'm doing is I'm meditating on scripture as I'm praying scripture. What does it mean to meditate on scripture? Some people say, oh, meditation. The Bible calls us to meditate. 
Psalm 1, verse 2, blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night. So that's Psalm 1, 2. Blessed are you if you meditate on the scriptures day and night. When Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and through the desert, think about this. Biblical scholars say this. I agree with this. Two million people wandering through a desert. No running water, no electricity, no grocery stores, no highways, no court systems, no elementary schools to send your kid off to school while you go to work. Two million people counting on God for everything. Going through the desert, Moses is leading them. And when he is done at the end, the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy that his eyes grew dim and he died. But right before his eyes grow dim and he dies, Moses hands it off and hands the baton to his successor, the young man, Joshua. You finish those five books, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, sixth book in the Old Testament. It's the book of Joshua. Chapter one, verse eight, young Joshua. How am I now gonna lead all these people into the promised land? God, that you said that Moses would do, but then because of sin and stuff, Moses didn't end up, but now you're asking me to do it. Joshua one, eight, God says, young man, do not depart from my law, but meditate on it. In the Hebrew, meditate on it day and night. Joshua 1, 8, Psalm 1, verse 2, tells us what the whole scripture in its entirety is telling us. We have to meditate on scripture. As I'm praying the scriptures over and over, repetition happens. Repetition is a good thing. Wouldn't it be nice if you just one time read one thing and then it never happened again? In other words, let's say you're having worry and anxiety. You go, Matthew chapter 6. You open up Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, going through verse 34. You start reading the scriptures and you're praying the scriptures. And when you get to the point where Jesus says, your heavenly father knows what you need even before you ask him, which ought to bring comfort in the midst of anxiety and worry. And then he says, now, therefore, then do not be anxious about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Poof, you're fixed for life. One reading, never to worry and be anxious again. Wouldn't that be amazing? But that's not how it works, does it? Over and over and over. Sometimes people will say to me, I started reading the Psalms every day, and pastor, I noticed this says a lot of the same things over and over and over. Why is that? I'm like, because God made our skulls thick, right? <laughs> yeah, because God knows it takes time to get to the core of who we are. I just wanna tell you one of the things that's important to me is repetition. Sometimes I just need to chew on. Do you know the, 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 the actual idea, meditate, in ancient Hebrew can also mean to chew upon. Just picture cattle, right? Chewing and chewing and churning and regard, I mean, they do some sick stuff, but <laughs> chewing and chewing and chewing, right? You're just, you, Jeremiah, right? It's like, I want to eat the words of God. King David, it's like sweeter than honey to my lips. It's that it requires a lot of repetition. The second thing in meditating on scripture in order to have peace of mind, to have that renewing of the mind so that I, I no longer am conformed, but I'm being reformed in my thinking because my body and my mind is a living sacrifice because I'm loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind is that that transformation comes by the power of the Holy Spirit through his word, through comprehension, not just repetition. It takes repetition sometimes for me to understand what I'm actually reading so I comprehend what I'm reading. And then it takes humility before the Lord to allow the word of God to then break us, to remake us, to actually change our opinion. You ever read something in the Bible and you're like, oh, I, didn't, I, don't, I, didn't, I don't believe that. And you're like, well, the word of God says it here and then it says it here and then Jesus taught it here. And now you get to decide, are you gonna go with the world or are you gonna go with the Lord? Are you gonna go with the world or are you gonna go with the word of God or the living word, the logos himself, Christ, wisdom personified in Jesus. And you and I get to make a decision which way we're gonna lean, but it's comprehension. But sometimes we're in ignorance we don't even necessarily understand. And I can tell you that truth that finally comes, we get to decide to go, oh, I didn't, I didn't understand that or know that. When Donna and I first got married, I was 24 years old and she was 21 years old. We were living in our little one bedroom apartment. It was Christmas time. And as newlyweds, I've shared this before, we were putting up our first Christmas tree and we got to the end of something we never went through in counseling and it was what would go on the top of the Christmas tree. And 
Some of you have star families and some of you have angel families. And we were different. We didn't have the same families. And I've said, you know, you better work it out while you're dating because you'll end up in counseling over this, okay? And uh, I've, I've shared that whole story. Well, what I didn't, had never shared with you is that something else happened that Christmas. Uh, is I turned to her and I said, hey, we need to put the Christmas wreath up on the door. And she said, what did you say? I said, we need to put the Christmas wreath up on the door. She said, are you saying Christmas reef? I said, yes, I'm 24 years old. And I appreciate you not laughing at me right now. I have my own mental health struggles. I do not need this added upon it today. She said, it's Christmas wreath. And I said, what did you say? She said, I said, Christmas wreath. I said, spell it. She goes, W R E A. T H. And I said, really? She said, yes. I said, I didn't know. Now, for those of you who are like, and you idiots listen to this guy each Sunday, <laughs> right? I get it. I really did. You're like, really? Yes. 24 years old in my whole life, I thought people were saying Christmas reef. R-E-E-F, reef. <laughs> Apparently, I was dead wrong, Right? Now, before you start to judge me, those of you in West Texas who keep saying similar, you're in the same boat as me. It is not, oh, that is so similar. It's similar. There is no you in similar. Can I get an amen? But I mean, we got a lot of people that love similar things. So you have a similar experience to me, don't you? Can you just admit that sometimes you don't comprehend things right? And when you read the word of God, can you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and say, correct me, teach me, show me. I was ignorant. I didn't know. Or I was arrogant and I did know and I just bowed up to you, Father. This is what praying the scriptures can do in the heart of someone who will humble themselves before the Lord. And this is what it requires for me to take captive every thought. Repetition, comprehension, and then ultimately reflection. This is where the Spirit takes the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, His presence, begins to work powerfully and starts to reshape and renew my thinking. And so now there is a renewing of the mind that brings the peace of mind because I have peace with God. Now I have the peace of God in the midst of the life storm, in the midst of the mental health struggle, and... It gives me an avenue of knowing, okay, Paul, Romans 8, I can groan inwardly as I'm still waiting and knowing that one day it is all going to be taken care of. Well, Tommy, what does that look like? Well, in closing here, I want to just show you just a couple. So it gives you an example and then we'll close in prayer. First of all, Let's say that I have something going on, or let's even say maybe it's a Sunday night or the middle of the week or whatever, and all of a sudden some worry or anxiety starts coming or a little sadness or depression, or maybe I hear some news uh, that's, that's hard to hear about a congregant that I love, and I find out that they have just been diagnosed with a new illness or uh, find that someone in the congregation has died. Uh, I mean, there's a, I just to tell you, in three decades of ministry, I cannot tell you what it's like to do hospital visits and on one floor, I'm with a family that just had a brand new baby and it's their first child and there's tears of elation. Then I go to the next floor and I'm in the critical, I'm at, you know, I'm, I'm near the ICU or the CCU, the critical unit and there's a congregant who has just passed away and there are tears of deep grief and both of those families are families that I love in the congregation. Every pastor that pastors eventually will experience that in the same moment in a hospital visit and then you go home at night and you're loving your own family going through because you know you're a human being you're going through your own uh, life and you start to feel the weight of these things right or it could even be just something personal for me like well, I've shared Sunday nights when uh, the spiritual depression and heaviness sets in from delivering a sermon what do I do well first of all I'm going to do exactly 
what 2 Corinthians 10, 5, take captive every thought to the Lord. Because if my thoughts start going dark or I start letting the enemy whisper lies into my ear to get me to conform to his thinking, then I'm gonna be sunk. So I open up the Bible, I can start reading. Maybe I'll read Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So I'll think, okay, what things have I been thinking about that are not true, that aren't noble or right or lovely or praiseworthy or admirable? And what things am I thinking that aren't even from God, but they're lies from the pit of hell? And I can start to change those. I might then, if I feel like, God, but I don't know if you're very close to me during this struggle, I might turn to Psalm 34, 18. And what will I do? Repetition, comprehension, reflection. Repetition, comprehension, reflection as I pray. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I already gave you Matthew 6. If I'm struggling with worry and anxiety, if I'm struggling with depression, I might go to the book of Jeremiah and start reading. I've done it before. I just start reading the book of Jeremiah, and by the time I get a few chapters in, I'm like, okay, God, I'm good. I've got it really, really easy at Hillside compared to Jeremiah. Right? You get to decide what you want to do to change your thinking by the power of the Word of God. And one of the things I definitely love to do is Revelation 21, 4, as I think in the midst of all of this, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. He wipes every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. In the end, there will be a final, ultimate, incredible deliverance for all mental health struggles. This gives me peace in the middle of my sadness. It gives me, here's here's what I will tell you. I do know this. There is no peace of mind if you don't saturate yourself in the word of God. There will be none. It is the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit that helps my mind to be renewed. And a year from now, It will be 40 years of me walking with Christ as a Christian. And I've needed 40 years, 365, 24-7. I need the Word of God and the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit to renew my thinking so that I can groan inwardly as I wait. Romans 8, verse 22, I can groan inwardly as I wait the redemption of my body and the coming of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he will then end all sadness and depression, anxiety and worry, stress and burnout and every mental health struggle, mild, moderate or severe and every mental illness. I know redemption is coming and finally we will no longer cry together together over such things. In the meantime, in the meantime, I only have one thing that I know that really, really, really helps me in the midst of it. Pray the scriptures. Pray the scriptures. Pray the scriptures. Find a list of scriptures for you, whatever you're dealing with. If you find something you're dealing with, print out a whole list of scriptures, tape it to the bathroom mirror as you're getting ready in the morning. Put it in your desk drawer at work. Put it on the nightstand. Go over it over and over and over. Do like Joshua Meditate on it day and night so that you can know that even if it doesn't dissipate or evaporate in that moment, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. I can tell you this, all of us, if we don't do this, we will wallow deeper and we will spiral so much more severe. Do not hear me saying that this is a quick fix. I've never said any of that during this series. I'm saying the opposite. It could be, but it might not be. But whatever it is, I know this. There's not a day in my life that I'm gonna have the peace of God if I'm not saturating myself in the word of God as the spirit of God breaks me to continue to remake me. And I know that to also be true for you. So I wanna encourage you, meditate, 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 and ask God, to renew the way that you think 
It'll help you so much in your battle. And don't forget, our staff is here for you as I close us in prayer. Our staff is here for you. Never, ever, ever, ever to embarrass you. Only to encourage you in your spiritual journey. Let's stand for our closing prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you have done and are doing in this series. Lord, Holy Spirit, we invite you deeply into our presence. Heavenly Father, we want your spirit to move. Lead us into the light. Lead us into the truth. And I pray for every single person here. For those who have not made peace with you, may they repent of their sins and receive your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. For those, Lord, that continue to have ongoing struggles with mental health, I'm asking you, Lord, through this series to not only bring comfort and encouragement to them that they are not alone, but to give them the courage to seek out help and counsel and prayer. And Lord, I'm asking you corporately, and I'm thanking you because I'm believing that you've already done it and are doing it. Thank you for changing and strengthening the cultural DNA and dynamics of Hillside Christian Church just simply because you led us to address this in our church family. May we never, ever, ever be the same again. May we be much more compassionate to one another. In Jesus' name, amen.